Chapter Three of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christofferson. It was twenty years ago, and on an evening in May. All day long there had been sunshine. Owing, doubtless, to the incident I am about to relate, the light and warmth of that long vanished day live with me still. I can see the great white clouds that moved across the strip of sky before my window, and feel again the spring languor which troubled my solitary work in the heart of London. Only at sunset did I leave the house. There was an unwonted sweetness in the air. The long vistas of newly lit lamps made a golden glow under the dusking flush of the sky. With no purpose but to rest and breathe, I wandered for half an hour, and found myself at length where Great Portland Street opens into Marleybone Road. Over the way, in the shadow of Trinity Church, was an old bookshop, well known to me. The gas-jet shining upon the stall with its rows of volumes drew me across. I began turning over pages, and, in variable consequence, fingering what money I had in my pocket. A certain book overcame me. I stepped into the little shop to pay for it. While standing at the stall, I had been vaguely aware of someone beside me, a man who was also looking over the books. As I came out again with my purchase, this stranger gazed at me intently, with a half-smile of peculiar interest. He seemed about to say something. I walked slowly away. The man moved in the same direction. Just in front of the church, he made a quick movement to my side and spoke. Pray, excuse me, sir. Don't misunderstand me. I only wish to ask whether you have noticed the name written on the fly-leaf of the book you have just bought. The respectful nervousness of his voice naturally made me suppose at first that the man was going to beg. But he seemed no ordinary mendicant. I judged him to be about sixty years of age. His long, thin hair and straggling beard were grizzled, and a somewhat moomy eye looked out from beneath his bloodless, hollowed countenance. He was very shabbily clad, yet as a fallen gentleman, and indeed his accent made it clear to what class he originally belonged. The expression with which he regarded me had so much intelligence, so much good nature, and at the same time such a pathetic diffidence, that I could not but answer him in the friendliest way. I had not seen the name on the fly-leaf, but at once I opened the book, and by the light of a gas-lamp read, inscribed in a very fine hand, W. R. Christofferson, 1849. "'It is my name,' said the stranger in a subdued and uncertain voice. "'Indeed? The book used to belong to you?' "'It belonged to me.' He laughed oddly, a tremulous little crow of a laugh, at the same time stroking his head as if to deprecate disbelief. "'You never heard of the sale of the Christofferson Library? "'To be sure, you were too young. "'It was in 1860. "'I have often come across books with my name in them on the stalls. "'Often.' I had happened to notice this just before you came up, and when I saw you look at it, I was curious to see whether you would buy it. Pray excuse the freedom I am taking. Lovers of books, don't you think? The broken question was completed by his look, and when I said that I quite understood and agreed with him, he crowed his little laugh. Have you a large library? he inquired, eyeing me wistfully. "'Oh, dear, no, only a few hundred volumes. "'Too many for one who has no house of his own.' "'He smiled good-naturedly, bent his head, "'and murmured just audibly, "'My catalogue numbered 24,718.' "'I was growing curious and interested. "'Venturing no more direct questions, "'I asked whether, at the time he spoke of, "'he lived in London.' "'If you have five minutes to spare,' was the timid reply, 
I will show you my house. I mean, again with the little crowing laugh, the house which was mine. Willingly, I walked on with him. He led me a short distance up the road skirting Regent's Park, and paused at length before a house in an imposing terrace. There, he whispered, I used to live. The window to the right of the door, that was my library. Ah! And he heaved a deep sigh. A misfortune befell you, I said, also in a subdued voice. The results of my own folly. I had enough for my needs, but thought I needed more. I let myself be drawn into business, I who knew nothing of such things. And there came the black day, the black day. We turned to retrace our steps, and walking slowly with heads bent, came in silence again to the church. I wonder whether you have bought any other of my books, asked Christopherson with his gentle smile, when we had paused as if for leave-taking. I replied that I did not remember to have come across his name before, then, on an impulse, asked whether he would care to have the book I carried in my hand. If so, with pleasure I would give it him. No sooner were the words spoken than I saw the delight they caused the hearer. He hesitated, murmured reluctance, but soon gratefully accepted my offer, and flushed with joy as he took the volume. I still have a few books, he said under his breath, as if he spoke of something he was ashamed to make known. But it is very rarely indeed that I can add to them. I feel I have not thanked you half enough. We shook hands and parted. My lodging at that time was in Camden Town. One afternoon, perhaps a fortnight later, I had walked for an hour or two, and on my way back I stopped at a bookstall in the High Street. Someone came up to my side. I looked and recognized Christopherson. Our greeting was like that of old friends. "'I have seen you several times lately,' said the broken gentleman, who looked shabbier than before in the broad daylight. "'But I... I didn't like to speak. I live not far from here.' "'Why, so do I,' and I added, without much thinking what I said, "'Do you live alone?' "'Alone. Oh, no, with my wife.' There was a curious embarrassment in his tone. His eyes were cast down, and his head moved uneasily. We began to talk of the books on the stall, and, turning away together, continued our conversation. Christofferson was not only a well-bred, but a very intelligent and even learned man. On his giving some proof of erudition, with the excessive modesty which characterized him, I asked whether he wrote. No, he had never written anything, never. He was only a bookworm, he said. Thereupon he crowed faintly and took his leave. It was not long before we again met by chance. We came face to face at a street corner in my neighborhood, and I was struck by a change in him. He looked older. A profound melancholy darkened his countenance. The hand he gave me was limp and his pleasure at our meeting found only a faint expression. "'I am going away,' he said in reply to my inquiring look. "'I am leaving London.' "'For good?' "'I fear so. And yet?' He made an obvious effort. "'I am glad of it. My wife's health has not been very good lately. She has needed country air. Yes, I am glad we have decided to go away. Very glad.' "'Very glad, indeed.' "'He spoke with an automatic sort of emphasis, "'his eyes wandering and his hands twitching nervously. "'I was on the point of asking what part of the country "'he had chosen for his retreat, "'when he abruptly added, "'I live just over there. "'Will you let me show you my books?' "'Of course I gladly accepted the invitation, "'and a couple of minutes' walk brought us to a house "'in a decent street.' where most of the ground-floor windows showed a card announcing lodgings. 
As we paused at the door, my companion seemed to hesitate, to regret having invited me. "'I'm really afraid it isn't worth your while,' he said timidly. "'The fact is, I haven't space to show my books properly.' I put aside the objection, and we entered. With anxious courtesy, Christopherson led me up the narrow staircase to the second-floor landing, and threw open a door. On the threshold I stood astonished. The room was a small one, and would in any case have only just sufficed for homely comfort, used as it evidently was for all daytime purposes. But certainly a third of the entire space was occupied by a solid mass of books. Volumes stacked several rows deep against two of the walls, and almost up to the ceiling. A round table and two or three chairs were the only furniture. There was no room, indeed, for more. The window being shut, and the sunshine glowing upon it, an intolerable stuffiness oppressed the air. Never had I been made so uncomfortable by the odour of printed paper and bindings. But, I exclaimed, you said you had only a few books. There must be five times as many here as I have. "'I forget the exact number,' murmured Christofferson in great agitation. "'You see, I can't arrange them properly. "'I have a few more in... in the other room.' "'He led me across the landing, opened another door, "'and showed me a little bedroom. "'Here the encumberment was less remarkable, "'but one wall had completely disappeared behind volumes.' and the bookishness of the air made it a disgusting thought that two persons occupied this chamber every night. We returned to the sitting-room. Christofferson began picking out books from the solid mass to show me, talking nervously, brokenly, with now and then a deep sigh or a crow of laughter, gave me a little light on his history. I learned that he had occupied these lodgings for the last eight years, that he had been twice married, that the only child he had had, a daughter by his first wife, had died long ago in childhood, and lastly, this came in a burst of confidence, with a very pleasant smile, that his second wife had been his daughter's governess. I listened with keen interest, and hoped to learn still more of the circumstance of this singular household. In the country, I remarked, "'You will no doubt have shelf-room?' "'At once his countenance fell. "'He turned upon me a woe-begone eye. "'Just as I was about to speak again, "'sounds from within the house caught my attention. "'There was a heavy foot on the stairs "'and a loud voice which seemed familiar to me. "'Ah!' exclaimed Christopherson with a start. "'Here comes someone who is going to help me "'in the removal of the books.' "'Come in, Mr. Pomfret, come in.' "'The door opened, and there appeared a tall, wiry fellow, "'whose sandy hair, light blue eyes, jutting jawbones, and large mouth, "'made a picture suggestive of small refinement, "'but of vigorous and wholesome manhood. "'No wonder I had seemed to recognize his voice. "'Though we only saw each other by chance at long intervals, "'Pomfret and I were old acquaintances.' Hello, he roared out. "'I didn't know you knew Mr. Christofferson.' "'I'm just as much surprised to find that you know him,' was my reply. The old book-lover gazed at us in nervous astonishment, then shook hands with the newcomer, who greeted him bluffly, yet respectfully. Pomfret spoke with a strong Yorkshire accent, and had all the angularity of demeanour which marks the typical Yorkshireman. He came to announce that everything had been settled for the packing and transporting of Mr. Christofferson's library. It remained only to decide the day. "'There's no hurry,' exclaimed Christofferson. "'There's really no hurry. I'm greatly obliged to you, Mr. Pomfret, for all the trouble you are taking. We'll settle the date in a day or two, a day or two. With a good-humoured nod, Pomfret moved to take his leave. Our eyes met. We left the house together. Out in the street again I took a deep breath of the summer air, 
which seemed sweet as in a meadow after that stifling room. My companion evidently had a like sensation, for he looked up to the sky and broadened out his shoulders. Eh, but it's a grand day. I'd give something for a walk on Ilkley Moors. As the best substitute within our reach, we agreed to walk across Regent's Park together. Pomfret's business took him in that direction, and I was glad of a talk about Christofferson. I learned that the old book-lover's landlady was Pomfret's aunt. Christofferson's story of affluence and ruin was quite true. Ruin complete, for at the age of forty he had been obliged to earn his living as a clerk or something of the kind. About five years later came his second marriage. "'You know Mrs. Christofferson?' asked Pomfret. "'No, I wish I did. Why?' "'Because she's the sort of woman it does you good to know, that's all. "'She's a lady, my idea of a lady. "'Christofferson's a gentleman, too, there's no denying it. "'If he wasn't, I think I should have punched his head before now. "'Oh, I know him well. "'Why, I lived in the house there with him for several years. "'She's a lady to the end of her little finger, "'and how her husband can have borne to see her living the life she has.' It's more than I can understand. By blank, I'd have turned burglar if I could have found no other way of keeping her in comfort. She works for her living, then? Ay, and for his, too. No, not teaching. She's in a shop in Tottenham Court Road. Has what they call a good place, and earns thirty shillings a week. It's all they have, but Christofferson buys books out of it. "'But has he never done anything since their marriage?' "'He did, for the first few years, I believe. "'But he had an illness, and that was the end of it. "'Since then he's only loafed. "'He goes to all the book sales "'and spends the rest of his time sniffing about the second-hand shops. "'She? Oh, she'd never say a word. "'Wait till you've seen her.' "'Well, but,' I asked, "'what has happened? "'How is it they're leaving London?' I, I'll tell you, I was coming to that. Mrs. Christofferson has relatives well off, a fat and selfish lot as far as I can make out, never lifted a finger to help her until now. One of them's a Mrs. Keating, the widow of some city porpoise, I'm told. Well, this woman has a home down in Norfolk. She never lives there, but a son of hers goes there to fish and shoot now and then. Well, this is what Mrs. Christofferson tells my aunt. Mrs. Keating has offered to let her and her husband live down yonder, rent-free, and their food provided. She's to be housekeeper, in fact, and keep the place ready for anyone who goes down. Christofferson, I can see, would rather stay where he is. Why, of course, he doesn't know how he'll live without the bookshops. But he's glad for all that on his wife's account. And it's none too soon, I can tell you. The poor woman couldn't go on much longer. My aunt says she's just about ready to drop, and sometimes, I know, she looks terribly bad. Of course she won't own it, not she. She isn't one of the complaining sort. But she talks now and then about the country, the places where she used to live. I've heard her, and it gives me a notion of what she's gone through all these years. I saw her a week ago, just when she had Mrs. Keating's offer, and I tell you I scarcely knew who it was. You never saw such a change in anyone in your life. Her face was like that of a girl of seventeen, and her laugh, you should have heard her laugh. Is she much younger than her husband? I asked. Twenty years at least. She's about forty, I think. I mused for a few moments. After all, it isn't an unhappy marriage. Unhappy? cried Pomfret. Why, there's never been a disagreeable word between them. That I'll warrant. Once Christofferson gets over the change, they'll have nothing more in the world to ask for. He'll potter over his books. You mean to tell me, I interrupted, that those books have all been bought out of his wife's thirty shillings a week? No, no. To begin with, he kept a few out of his old library. Then, when he was earning his own living, he bought a great many. He told me once that he's often lived on sixpence a day to have money for the books. 
a rum old owl. But for all that he's a gentleman, and you can't help liking him. I shall be sorry when he's out of reach. For my own part, I wished nothing better than to hear of Christopherson's departure. The story I had heard made me uncomfortable. It was good to think of that poor woman rescued at last from her life of toil, and in these days of midsummer free to enjoy the country she loved. A touch of envy mingled, I confess, with my thoughts of Christopherson, who henceforth had not a care in the world, and without reproach might delight in his hoarded volumes. One could not imagine that he would suffer seriously by the removal of his old haunts. I promised myself to call on him in a day or two. By choosing Sunday I might perhaps be lucky enough to see his wife. And on Sunday afternoon I was on the point of setting forth to pay this visit, when in came Pomfret. He wore a surly look, and kicked clumsily against the furniture as he crossed the room. His appearance was a surprise, for, though I had given him my address, I did not in the least expect that he would come to see me. A certain pride, I suppose, characteristic of his rugged strain, having always made him shy of such intimacy. "'Did you ever hear the like of that?' he shouted, half angrily. "'It's all over. They're not going, and all because of those blamed books.' and spluttering and growling he made known what he had just learned at his aunt's home on the previous afternoon the christophersons had been surprised by a visit from their relative and would-be benefactress mrs keating never before had this lady called upon them she came no doubt this could only be conjectured to speak with them of their approaching removal the close of the conversation a very brief one was overheard by the landlady, for Mrs. Keating spoke loudly as she descended the stairs. Impossible, quite impossible. I couldn't think of it. How could you dream for a moment that I would let you fill my house with musty old books? Most unhealthy. I never knew anything so extraordinary in my life. Never. And so she went out to her carriage and was driven away and the landlady, presently having occasion to go upstairs, was aware of a dead silence in the room where the Christophersons were sitting. She knocked, prepared with some excuse, and found the couple side by side, smiling sadly. At once they told her the truth. Mrs. Keating had come because of a letter in which Mrs. Christopherson had mentioned the fact that her husband had a good many books, and hoped he might be permitted to remove them to the house in Norfolk. She came to see the library, with the result already heard. They had the choice between sacrificing the books and losing what their relative offered. Christopherson refused, I let fall. I suppose his wife saw that it was too much for him. At all events, they'd agreed to keep the books and lose the house. And there's an end of it. I haven't been so riled about anything for a long time. Meanwhile, I had been reflecting. It was easy for me to understand Christopherson's state of mind, and without knowing Mrs. Keating, I saw that she must be a person whose benefactions would be a good deal of a burden. After all, was Mrs. Christopherson so very unhappy? Was she not the kind of woman who lived by sacrifice, one who had far rather lead a life disagreeable to herself than change it at the cost of discomfort to her husband? This view of the matter irritated Pomfret, and he broke into objurgations, directed partly against Mrs. Keating, partly against Christopherson. It was an infernal shame, that was all he could say, and after all I rather inclined to his opinion. When two or three days had passed, curiosity drew me toward the Christopherson's dwelling. Walking along the opposite side of the street, I looked up at their window, and there was the face of the old bibliophile. Evidently he was standing at the window in idleness, perhaps in trouble. At once he beckoned to me, but before I could knock at the house door, he had descended and came out. "'May I walk a little way with you?' he asked. There was worry on his features. For some moments we went on in silence." "'So you have changed your mind about leaving London?' 
I said, as if carelessly. You have heard from Mr. Pomfret? Well, yes, yes, I think we shall stay where we are, for the present. Never have I seen a man more painfully embarrassed. He walked with a head bent, shoulders stooped, and shuffled, indeed, rather than walked. Even so might a man bear himself who felt guilty of some peculiar meanness. Presently words broke from him. To tell you the truth, there is a difficulty about the books. He glanced furtively at me, and I saw he was trembling in all his nerves. As you see, my circumstances are not brilliant. He half choked himself with a crow. The fact is, we were offered a house in the country, on certain conditions, by a relative of Mrs. Christopherson, and, unfortunately, it turned out that my library is regarded as an objection, a fatal objection. We have quite reconciled ourselves to staying where we are. I could not help asking without emphasis whether Mrs. Christopherson would have cared for life in the country but no sooner were the words out of my mouth than I regretted them, so evidently did they hit my companion in a tender place. "'I think she would have liked it,' he answered, with a strangely pathetic look at me, as if he entreated my forbearance. "'But,' I suggested, "'couldn't you make some arrangements about the books? Couldn't you take a room for them in another house, for instance?' Christopherson's face was sufficient answer. It reminded me of his pennilessness. "'We think no more about it,' he said. "'The matter is settled, quite settled.' There was no pursuing the subject. At the next parting of the ways we took leave of each other. I think it was not more than a week later when I received a postcard from Pomfret. He wrote, "'Just as I expected. Mrs. C. seriously ill.' That was all. Mrs. C. could, of course, only mean Mrs. Christopherson. I mused over the message. It took hold of my imagination, wrought upon my feelings, and that afternoon I again walked along the interesting street. There was no face at the window. After a little hesitation, I decided to call at the house and speak with Pomfret's aunt. It was she who opened the door to me. We had never seen each other, but when I mentioned my name and said I was anxious to have news of Mrs. Christopherson, she led me into a sitting-room and began to talk confidentially. She was a good-natured Yorkshire woman, very unlike the common London landlady. Yes, Mrs. Christopherson had been taken ill two days ago. It began with a long fainting fit. She had a feverish, sleepless night the doctor was sent for, and he had her removed out of the stuffy, book-cumbered bedroom into another chamber, which luckily happened to be vacant. There she lay, utterly weak and worn, all but voiceless, able only to smile at her husband, who never moved from the bedside day or night. He, too, said the landlady, would soon break down. He looked like a ghost and seemed half-crazed. What? I asked. Could be the cause of this illness. The good woman gave me an odd look, shook her head, and murmured that the reason was not far to seek. Did she think, I asked, that disappointment might have something to do with it? Why, of course she did. For a long time the poor lady had been all but at the end of her strength, and this came as a blow beneath which she sank. Your nephew and I have talked about it, I said. He thinks that Mr. Christopherson didn't understand what a sacrifice he asked his wife to make. I think so, too, was the reply. But he begins to see it now, I can tell you. He says nothing, but... There was a tap at the door, and a hurried, tremulous voice begged the landlady to go upstairs. What is it, sir? she asked. I'm afraid she's worse said Christopherson, turning his haggard face to me with startled recognition. Do come up at once, please. Without a word to me, he disappeared with the landlady. I could not go away. For some ten minutes I fidgeted about the little room, listening to every sound in the house. Then came a footfall on the stairs, and the landlady rejoined me. 
"'It's nothing,' she said. "'I almost think she might drop off to sleep if she's left quiet. "'He worries her, poor man, sitting there and asking her every two minutes how she feels. "'I've persuaded him to go to his room, "'and I think it might do him good if you went and had a bit of talk with him.' I mounted at once to the second-floor sitting-room, and found Christopherson sunk upon a chair, his head falling forwards, the image of despairing misery. As I approached, he staggered to his feet. He took my hand in a shrinking, shame-faced way, and could not raise his eyes. I uttered a few words of encouragement, but they had the opposite effect to that design. "'Don't tell me that,' he moaned half-resentfully. "'She's dying, she's dying. "'Say what they will, I know it. "'Have you a good doctor?' "'I think so, but it's too late, it's too late.' "'As he dropped to his chair again, I sat down by him. "'The silence of a minute or two was broken by a thunderous rat-tat at the house door. "'Christopherson leapt to his feet, rushed from the room. "'I, half fearing that he had gone mad, "'followed to the head of the stairs. "'In a moment he came up again, limp and wretched as before. "'It was the postman,' he muttered. "'I am expecting a letter. "'Conversation seeming impossible, "'I shaped a phrase preliminary to withdrawal, "'but Christopherson would not let me go. "'I should like to tell you,' he began, "'looking at me like a dog under punishment, "'that I have done all I could.' As soon as my wife fell ill, and when I saw, I had only begun to think of it that way, how she felt the disappointment, I went at once to Mrs. Keating's house to tell her that I would sell the books. But she was out of town. I wrote to her. I said I regretted my folly. I entreated her to forgive me and to renew her kind offer. There has been plenty of time for a reply, but she doesn't answer. He had in his hand what I saw was a bookseller's catalogue, just delivered by the postman. Mechanically, he tore off the wrapper and even glanced over the first page. Then, as if conscience stabbed him, he flung the thing violently away. "'The chance has gone,' he exclaimed, taking a hurried step or two along the little strip of floor left free by the mountain of books. "'Of course,' she said she would rather stay in London.' "'Of course,' she said, "'what she knew would please me. "'When, when did she ever say anything else? "'And I was cruel enough, base enough, "'to let her make the sacrifice.' "'He waved his arms frantically. "'Didn't I know what it cost her? "'Couldn't I see in her face "'how her heart leapt at the hope "'of going to live in the country? "'I knew what she was suffering. "'I knew it, I tell you.' and like a selfish coward i let her suffer i let her drop down and die die any hour i said may bring you the reply from mrs keating of course it will be favourable and the good news too late i have killed her that woman won't write she's one of the vulgar rich and we offended her pride and such as she never forgive he sat down for a moment, but started up again in an agony of mental suffering. She is dying, and there, there, that's what has killed her. He gesticulated wildly towards the books. I have sold her life for those. Oh, oh! With this cry, he seized a half-dozen volumes, and before I could understand what he was about, he had flung up the window-sash and cast the books into the street. Another batch followed. I heard the thud upon the pavement. Then I caught him by the arm, held him fast, begged him to control himself. "'They shall all go,' he cried. "'I loathe the sight of them. They have killed my dear wife.' He said it sobbing, and at the last words tears streamed from his eyes. I had no difficulty now in restraining him. He met my look with a gaze of infinite pathos, and talked on while he wept. If you knew what she has been to me. When she married me I was a ruined man, twenty years older. 
I have given her nothing but toil and care. You shall know everything. For years and years I have lived on the earnings of her labor. Worse than that, I have starved and stinted her to buy books. Oh, the shame of it, the wickedness of it. It was my vice, the vice that enslaved me, just as if it had been drinking or gambling. I couldn't resist the temptation, though every day I cried shame upon myself and swore to overcome it. She never blamed me, never a word, nay, not a look of a reproach. I lived in idleness. I never tried to save her that daily toil at the shop. Do you know that she worked in the shop? She, with her knowledge and her refinement, leading such a life as that. Think that I have passed the shop a thousand times, coming home with a book in my hands. I had the heart to pass, and to think of her there. Oh! Oh! Someone was knocking at the door. I went to open, and saw the landlady her face set in astonishment and her arms full of books. "'It's all right,' I whispered. "'Put them down on the floor there. Don't bring them in. An accident.' Christofferson stood behind me. His look asked what he durst not speak. I said it was nothing, and by degrees brought him into a calmer state. Luckily, the doctor came before I went away, and he was able to report a slight improvement.' The patient had slept a little and seemed likely to sleep again. Christofferson asked me to come again before long. There was no one else, he said, who cared anything about him, and I promised to call the next day. I did so early in the afternoon. Christofferson must have watched for my coming. Before I could raise the knocker, the door flew open, and his face gleamed such a greeting as astonished me. He grasped my hand in both his, the letter has come. We are to have the house. And how is Mrs. Christofferson? Better, much better. Heaven be thanked. She slept almost from the time when you left yesterday afternoon till early this morning. The letter came by the first post, and I told her not the whole truth, he added under his breath. She thinks I am to be allowed to take the books with me, and if you could have seen her smile of contentment, but they will all be sold and carried away before she knows about it, and when she sees that I don't care a snap of the fingers. He had turned into the sitting-room on the ground floor. Walking about excitedly, Christofferson gloried in the sacrifice he had made. Already a letter was dispatched to a bookseller who would buy the whole library as it stood. But would he not keep a few volumes, I asked? Surely there could be no objection to a few shelves of books, and how would he live without them? At first he declared vehemently that not a volume should be kept. He never wished to see a book again as long as he lived. But Mrs. Christofferson, I urged, would she not be glad of something to read now and then? At this he grew pensive. We discussed the matter, and it was arranged that a box should be packed with select volumes and taken down into Norfolk together with the rest of their luggage. Not even Mrs. Keating could object to this, and I strongly advised him to take her permission for granted. And so it was done. By discreet management, the piled volumes were stowed in bags, carried downstairs, emptied into a cart, and conveyed away so quietly that the sick woman was aware of nothing. In telling me about it, Christofferson crowed as I had never heard him, but methought his eye avoided that part of the floor which had formerly been hidden, and in the course of our conversation he now and then became absent, with head bowed. Of the joy he felt in his wife's recovery there could, however, be no doubt. The crisis through which he had passed had made him in appearance a yet older man. When he declared his happiness, tears came into his eyes, and his head shook with a senile tremor. Before they left London, I saw Mrs. Christofferson, a pale, thin, slightly made woman, who had never been what is called good-looking, but her face, if ever face did so, declared a brave and loyal spirit. She was not joyous, 
she was not sad, but in her eyes, as I looked at them again and again, I read the profound thankfulness of one to whom fate has granted her soul's desire. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Humblebee. The school was assembled for evening prayers, some threescore boys representing, for the most part, the well to do middle class of a manufacturing county. At either end of the room glowed a pleasant fire, for it was February and the weather had turned to frost. Silence reigned, but on all the young faces turned to where the headmaster sat at his desk appeared an unwonted expression, an eager expectancy, as though something out of the familiar routine were about to happen. When the master's voice at length sounded, he did not read from the book before him. Gravely, slowly, he began to speak of an event which had that day stirred the little community with profound emotion. Two of our number are this evening absent. Happily, most happily, absent but for a short time. In our prayers we shall render thanks to the good providence which has saved us from a terrible calamity. I do not desire to dwell upon the circumstances that one of these boys, Chadwick, had committed worse than an imprudence in venturing upon the long pond. It was in disregard of my injunction. I had distinctly made it known that the ice was still unsafe. We will speak no more of that. All we can think of at present is the fact that Chadwick was on the point of losing his life, that in all human probability he would have been drowned, but for the help heroically afforded him by one of his schoolfellows. I say heroically, and I am sure I do not exaggerate. In the absence of Humblebee, I may declare that he nobly periled his own life to save that of another. It was a splendid bit of courage, a fine example of pluck and promptitude and vigour. We have all cause this night to be proud of Humblebee. The solemn voice paused. There was an instant's profound silence. Then, from somewhere amid the rows of listeners, sounded a clear boyish note. "'Sir, may we give three cheers for Humplebee?' "'You may.' The three score leapt to their feet, and volleys of cheering made the schoolroom echo. Then the master raised his hand, the tumult subsided, and after a few moments of agitated silence, prayers began. Next morning there appeared, as usual, at his desk a short, thin, red-headed boy of sixteen, whose plain, freckled face denoted good humour and a certain intelligence, but would never have drawn attention amongst the livelier and comelier physiognomies grouped about him. This was Humplebee. Hitherto he had been an insignificant member of the school, one of those boys who excel neither at games nor at lessons of whom nothing is expected, and rarely, if ever, get into trouble, and who are liked in a rather contemptuous way. Of a sudden he shone glorious. All tongues were busy with him, all eyes regarded him, every one wished for the honour of his friendship. Humpleby looked uncomfortable. He had the sniffy beginnings of a cold, the result of yesterday's struggle in icy water and his usual diffident and monosyllabic inclination were intensified by the position in which he found himself. Clappings on the shoulder from bigger boys, who had been wont to joke about his name, made him flush nervously. To be addressed as Humpy or Beetle or Buzz, even though in a new tone, seemed to gratify him as little as before. It was plain that Humplebee would much have liked to be left alone. 
he stuck as closely as possible to his desk, and out of school time tried to steal apart from the throng. But an ordeal awaited him. Early in the afternoon there arrived from a great town not far away a well-dressed and high-complexioned man whose every look and accent declared commercial importance. This was Mr. Chadwick, father of the boy who had all but drowned. He and the headmaster held private talk, and presently they sent for Humplebee. Merely to enter the study was at any time Humplebee's dread. To do so under the present circumstances caused him anguish of spirit. Ha! Here he is, exclaimed Mr. Chadwick, in the voice of bluff geniality, which seemed to him appropriate. Humpleby, let me shake hands with you. Humpleby, I am proud to make your acquaintance. Prouder still to thank you, to thank you, my boy. The lad was painfully overcome. His hands quivered. He stood like one convicted of disgraceful behaviour. I think you have heard of me, Humpleby. "'Leonard has no doubt spoken to you of his father. "'Perhaps my name has reached you in other ways.' "'Yes, sir,' faltered the boy. "'You mean that you know me as a public man?' urged Mr. Chadwick, whose eyes glimmered a hungry vanity. "'Yes, sir,' whispered Humbleby. "'Ha! I see. You already take an intelligent interest in things beyond school.' They tell me you are sixteen, Humpleby. Come now, what are your ideas about the future? I don't mean, Mr. Chadwick rolled a laugh, about the future of mankind, or even the future of the English race. You and I may perhaps discuss such questions a few years hence. In the meantime, what are your personal ambitions? In brief, what would you like to be, Humpleby? Under the eyes of his master and of the commercial potentate, Humblebee stood voiceless. He gasped once or twice like an expiring fish. "'Courage, my boy, courage!' cried Mr. Chadwick. "'Your father, I believe, destines you for commerce. Is that your own wish? Speak freely. Speak as though I were a friend you have known all your life.' "'I should like to please my father, sir.' jerked from the boy's lips good admirable that's the spirit i like humpleby then you have no marked predilection that was what i wanted to discover well well we shall see meanwhile humpleby get on with your arithmetic you are good at arithmetic i am sure not very sir come come that's your modesty but i like you none the worse for it humpleby well well get on with your work my boy and we shall see we shall see therewith to his vast relief humpleby found himself dismissed later in the day he received a summons to the bedroom where mr chadwick's son was being carefully nursed leonard chadwick about the same age as his rescuer had never deigned to pay much attention to humpleby whom he regarded as stupid and plebeian but the boy's character was marked by a generous impulsiveness which came out strongly in the present circumstances hallo humpy he cried raising himself up when the other entered so you pulled me out of that hole shake hands buzzy old fellow you had a talk with my governor haven't you what do you think of him humpleby muttered something incoherent my governor's going to make your fortune humpy cried leonard he told me so and when he says a thing he means it he's going to start you in business when you leave school most likely you'll go into his own office how will you like that humpy my governor thinks no end of you says you're a brick and so you are i shan't forget that you pulled me out of that hole old chap we shall be friends all our lives you know tell me what you thought of my governor when he was on his legs again leonard continued to treat humpleby with grateful if somewhat condescending friendliness in the talks they had together the great man's son continually expatiated upon his preserver's brilliant prospects beyond possibility of doubt humpleby would some day be a rich man 
Mr. Chadwick had said so, and whatever he purposed came to pass. To all this Humplebee listened in a dogged sort of way, now and then smiling, but seldom making verbal answer. In school he was not quite the same boy as before his exploit. He seemed duller, less attentive, and at times even incurred reproaches for work ill done, previously a thing unknown. When the holidays came, no boy was so glad as Humplebee. His heart sang within him as he turned his back upon the school and began the journey homeward. The home was in the town illuminated by Mr. Chadwick's commercial and municipal brilliance. Over a small draper's shop, in one of the outskirt streets, stood the name of Humplebee the Draper. About sixty years of age, he had known plenty of misfortune and sorrows, with scant admixture of happiness. Nowadays things were somewhat better with him. By dint of severe economy he had put aside two or three hundred pounds, and he was able, moreover, to give his son, an only child, what is called a sound education. In the limited rooms above the shop there might have been a measure of quiet content and hopefulness, but for Mrs. Humplebee. She, considerably younger than her husband, fretted against their narrow circumstances, and grudged the money that was being spent, wasted, she called it, on the boy Harry. From his father Harry never heard talk of pecuniary troubles, but the mother lost no opportunity of letting him know that they were poor, miserably poor, and adding that if he did not work hard at school he was simply a cold-hearted criminal and robbed his parents of their bread. But during the last month or two a change had come upon the household. One day the draper received a visit from the great Mr. Chadwick, who told a wonderful story of Harry's heroism, and made proposals sounding so nobly generous that Mr. Humplebee was overcome with gratitude. Harry, as his father knew, had no vocation for the shop. To get him a place in a manufacturer's office seemed the best thing that could be aimed at, and here was Mr. Chadwick talking of easy bookkeeping, quick advancement, and all manner of vaguely splendid possibilities in the future. The draper's joy proved Mrs. Humplebee's opportunity. She put forward a project which had of late been constantly on her mind and on her lips, to wit, that they should transfer their business into larger premises and give themselves a chance of prosperity. Humplebee need no longer hesitate. He had his little capital to meet the first expenses, and if need arose, there need not be the slightest doubt that Mr. Chadwick would assist him. A kind gentleman, Mr. Chadwick, had he not expressly desired to see Harry's mother, and had he not assured her in every way possible of his debt and gratitude he felt towards all who bore the name of Humplebee? The draper, if he neglected his opportunity, would be an idiot, a mere idiot. So when the boy came home for his holidays, he found two momentous things decided. First, that he should forthwith enter Mr. Chadwick's office. Secondly, that the little shop should be abandoned and a new one taken in a better neighbourhood. Now Harry Humplebee had in his soul a secret desire and a secret abhorrence. Ever since he could read, his delight had been in books of natural history. Beasts, birds, and fishes possessed his imagination, and for nothing else in the intellectual world did he really care. With poor resources, he had learned a great deal of his beloved subjects. Whenever he could get away into the fields, he was happy. To lie still for hours watching some wild thing, noting its features and its ways, seemed to him perfect enjoyment. His treasure was a collection, locked in a cupboard at home, of eggs, skeletons, butterflies, beetles, and I know not what. His father regarded all this as harmless amusement. His mother contemptuously tolerated it, or, in worse humour, condemned it as waste of time. When at school the boy had frequent opportunities of pursuing his study, for he was in mid-country and could wander as he liked on free afternoons. 
but neither the headmaster nor his assistant thought it worth while to pay heed to Humplebee's predilection. True, it had been noticed more than once that in writing an essay he showed unusual observation of natural things. This, however, did not strike his educators as a matter of any importance. It was not their business to discover what Humpleby could do and wished to do, but to make him do things they regarded as desirable. Humpleby was marked for commerce. He must study compound interest and be strong at discount. Yet the boy loathed every such mental effort, and the name of business made him sick at heart. How he longed to unbosom himself to his father! and in the first week of his holiday he had a chance of doing so, a wonderful chance, such as had never entered his dreams. The town possessed a museum of natural history, where, of course, Harry often spent leisure hours. Half a year ago a happy chance had brought him into conversation with the curator, who could not but be struck by the lad's intelligence, and who took an interest in him. Now they met again, they had one or two long talks, with the result that, on a Sunday afternoon, the curator of the museum took the trouble to call upon Mr. Humpleby to speak with him about his son. At the museum was wanted a lad with a taste for natural history to perform at first certain easy duties with the prospect of further advancement here or elsewhere. It seemed to the curator that Harry was the very boy for the place. Would Mr. Humpleby like to consider this suggestion? Now, if it had been made to him half a year ago, such an offer would have seemed to Mr. Humpleby well worth consideration, and he knew that Harry would have heard of it with delight. As it was, he could not entertain the thought for a moment. Impossible to run the risk of offending Mr. Chadwick. Moreover, who could hesitate between the modest possibilities of the museum and such a career as waited the lad under the protection of his powerful friend? With nervous haste the draper explained how matters stood, excused himself, and begged that not another word on the subject might be spoken in his son's hearing. Harry Humpleby knew what he had lost. The curator, in talking with him, had already thrown out his suggestion. At their next meeting he discreetly made known to the boy that other counsels must prevail. For the first time Harry felt a vehement impulse, prompting him to speak on his own behalf, to assert and to plead for his own desires, but courage failed him. He heard his father loud in praise of Mr. Chadwick, intent upon the gratitude and respect due to that admirable man. He knew how his mother would exclaim at the mere hint of disinclination to enter the great man's office. And so he held his peace, though it cost him bitterness of heart and even secret tears. A long, long time passed before he could bring himself to enter again the museum doors. He sat on a stool in Mr. Chadwick's office, a clerk at a trifling salary. Everything, his father reminded him, must have a beginning. Let him work well, and his progress would be rapid. Two years passed, and he was in much the same position. His salary had increased by one half, but his work remained the same, mechanical, dreary, hateful to him in its monotony. Meanwhile, his father's venture in the new premise had led to great embarrassments. Business did not thrive. The day came when Mr. Humpleby, trembling and shamefaced, felt himself drawn to beg help of his son's so-called benefactor. He came away from the interview with empty hands. Worse than that, he had heard things about Harry which darkened his mind with a new anxiety. I greatly fear said Mr. Chadwick, that your son must seek a place in some other office. It's a painful thing. I wish I could have kept him. But the fact of the matter is that he shows utter incapacity. I have no fault to find with him otherwise. A good lad. In a smaller place of business he might do well enough. But he's altogether below the mark in an office such as mine. 
Don't distress yourself, Mr. Humpleby, I beg. I shall make it my care to inquire for suitable openings. You shall hear from me. You shall hear from me. Pray consider that your son is under notice to leave this day month. As for the other matter of which you spoke, I can only repeat that the truest kindness is only to refuse assistance. I assure you it is. The circumstances forbid it. Clearly what you have to do is call together your creditors and arrive at an understanding. It is my principle never to try to prop up a hopeless concern such as yours evidently is. Good day to you, Mr. Humpleby. Good day. A year later, several things had happened. Mr. Humpleby was dead. His penniless widow had gone to live in another town on the charity of poor relatives. And Harry Humpleby sat in another office, drawing the salary at which he had begun under Mr. Chadwick, his home a wretched bedroom in the house of working folk. It did not appear to the lad that he had suffered any injustice. He knew his own inaptitude for the higher kind of office work, and he had expected his dismissal by Mr. Chadwick long before it came. What he did resent, and profoundly, was Mr. Chadwick's refusal to aid his father in that last death grapple with ruinous circumstance. At the worst moment, Harry wrote a letter to Leonard Chadwick, whom he had never seen since he left school. He told in simple terms the position of his family, and, without a word of justifying reminiscence, asked his schoolfellow to help them if he could. To this letter a reply came from London. Leonard Chadwick wrote briefly and hurriedly, but in good-natured terms. He was really very sorry indeed that he could do so little. The fact was, just now he stood on anything but good terms with his father, who kept him abominably short of cash. He enclosed five pounds, and, if possible, would soon send more. Don't suppose I have forgotten what I owe you. "'As soon as ever I find myself in an independent position, "'you shall have substantial proof of my enduring gratitude. "'Keep me informed of your address.' "'Humpleby made no second application, "'and Leonard Chadwick did not again break silence. "'The years flowed on. "'At five-and-twenty, Humpleby toiled in the same office, "'but he could congratulate himself on a certain progress.' By dogged resolve, he had acquired something like efficiency in the duties of a commercial clerk, and the salary he now earned allowed him to contribute to the support of his mother. More or less reconciled to the day's labor, he had resumed in leisure hours his favorite study. A free library supplied him with useful books, and whenever it was possible he went his way into the fields, searching, collecting, observing but his life had another interest which threatened rivalry to this intellectual pursuit. Humpleby had set eyes upon the maiden destined to be his heart's desire. She was the daughter of a fellow clerk, a man who had grown grey in the service of the ledger. Timidly he sought to win her kindness, as yet scarce daring to hope, dreaming only of some happy change of position which might encourage him to speak. The girl was as timid as himself. She had a face of homely prettiness, a mind uncultured but sympathetic, absorbed in domestic cares, with few acquaintances. She led the simplest of lives, and would have been all but content to live on in gentle hope for a score of years. The two were beginning to understand each other, for their silence was more eloquent than their speech. One summer day, the last day of his brief holiday, Humpleby was returning by train from a visit to his mother. Alone in a third-class carriage, seeming to read a newspaper, but in truth dreaming of a face he hoped to see in a few hours, he suddenly found himself jerked out of his seat, flung violently forward, bumped on the floor, and, last of all, rolled into a sort of bundle he knew not where. Recovering from a daze, he said to himself, Why, this is an accident, a collision. Then he tried to unroll himself, and in the effort found that one of his arms was useless. 
More than that, it pained him horribly. He stood up and tottered to the seat. Then the carriage door opened, and a voice shouted, "'Anybody hurt here?' "'I think my arm is broken,' answered Humplebee. Two men helped him to alight. The train had stopped just outside a small station. On a cross line in front of the engine lay a goods truck smashed to pieces. People were rushing about with cries and gesticulations. "'Yes, the arm is broken,' remarked one of the men who had assisted Humplebee. "'It looks as if you were the only passenger injured.' That proved indeed to be the case. No one else had suffered more than a jolt or a bruise. The crowd clustered about this hero of the broken arm, expressing sympathy and offering suggestions. Among them was a well-dressed young man, rather good-looking and of lively demeanour, who seemed to enjoy the excitement. He, after gazing fixedly at the pain-stricken face, exclaimed in a voice of wonder, "'By Jove, it's Humplebee!' The sufferer turned towards him who spoke. His eyes brightened, for he recognized the face of Leonard Chadwick. Neither one nor the other had greatly altered during the past ten years. They presented exactly the same contrast of personal characteristic as when they were at school together. With vehement friendliness, Chadwick at once took upon himself the care of the injured clerk. He shouted for a cab, he found out where the nearest doctor lived. In a quarter of an hour he had his friend under the doctor's roof. When the fracture had been set and bandaged, they travelled on together to their native town, only a few miles distant. Humplebee knowing for the first time in his life the luxury of a first-class compartment. On their way, Chadwick talked exuberantly. He was delighted at this meeting. Why, one of his purposes in coming north had been to search out Humplebee, whom he had so long scandalously neglected. The fact is, I've been going through queer times myself. The governor and I can't get along together. We quarrelled years ago. There's not much chance of our making it up. I've no doubt that was the real reason of his dismissing you from his office. A mean thing. The governor's a fine old boy, but he has his nasty side. He is very tight about money, and I, well, I'm a bit too much the other way, no doubt. He's kept me in low water, confound him, but I'm independent of him now. I'll tell you all about it tomorrow. You'll feel better able to talk. Expect me at eleven in the morning. Through a night of physical suffering, Humplebee was supported by a new hope. Chadwick the son, warm-hearted and generous, made a strong contrast with Chadwick the father, pompous and insincere. When the young man spoke of his abiding gratitude, there was no possibility of distrusting him. His voice rang true, and his handsome features wore a delightful frankness. Punctual to his appointment, Leonard appeared next morning. He entered the poor lodging as if it had been a luxurious residence talked suavely and gaily with the landlady who was tending her invalid and when alone with his old schoolfellow launched into a detailed account of a great enterprise in which he was concerned not long ago he had become acquainted with one geldershaw a man somewhat older than himself personally most attractive and very keen in business Geldershaw had just been appointed London representative of a great manufacturing firm in Germany. It was a most profitable undertaking, and out of pure friendship he had offered a share in the business to Leonard Chadwick. Of course I put my money into it. The fact is, I have dropped in for a few thousands from a good old aunt, who has been awfully kind to me since the governor and I fell out. I couldn't possibly have found a better investment— it means eight or nine per cent, my boy, at the very least. And look here, Humplebee, of course you can keep books? Yes, I can, answered the listener conscientiously. Then, old fellow, a first-rate place is open to you. We want someone we can thoroughly trust. You're the very man Geldershaw had in his eye. Would you mind telling me what screw you get at present? Two pounds ten a week. Ha ha! laughed Chadwick exultantly. With us, you shall begin at double the figure. 
and I'll see to it that you have a rise after the first year. What's more, Humpleby, as soon as we get fairly going, I promise you a share in the business. Don't say a word, old boy. My governor treated you abominably. I've been in your debt for ten years or so, as you know very well, and often enough I felt deucedly ashamed of myself. Five pounds a week to begin with, and a certainty of a comfortable interest in a thriving affair. Come now, is it agreed? Humpleby forgot his pain. He felt ready to jump out of bed and travel straightway to London. "'And you know,' pursued Chadwick, when they had shaken hands warmly, "'that you have a claim for damages on the railway company. Leave that to me. I'll put the thing in train at once, through my own solicitor. You shall pocket a substantial sum, my boy. Well, I'm afraid I must be off. I've got my hands full of business. Quite a new thing for me to have something serious to do.' I enjoy it. If I can't see you again before I go back to town, you shall hear from me in a day or two. Here's my London address. Chuck up your place here at once, so as to be ready for us as soon as your arm's all right. Geldershaw shall write you a formal engagement. Happily, his broken arm was the left. Humpleby could use his right hand, and did so, very soon after Chadwick's departure, to send an account of all that had befallen him to his friend Mary Bowes. It was the first time he had written to her. His letter was couched in terms of studious respect, with many apologies for the liberty he took. Of the accident he made light, a few days would see him re-established, but he dwelt with some emphasis on the meeting with Leonard Chadwick and what had resulted from it. I did him a good turn once, when we were at school together. He is a good, warm-hearted fellow, and has sought this opportunity of showing that he remembered the old time. Thus did Humpleby refer to the great event of his boyhood. Having dispatched the letter, he waited feverishly for Miss Bowes' reply. But days passed, and still he waited in vain. Agitation delayed his recovery. He was suffering as he had never suffered in his life, when there came a letter from London, signed with the name of Geldershaw, repeating in formal terms the offer made to him by Leonard Chadwick, and requesting his immediate acceptance or refusal. This plucked him out of his despondent state, and spurred him to action. With the help of his landlady, he dressed himself, and, having concealed his bandaged arm as well as possible, drove in a cab to Miss Bowes' dwelling. The hour being before noon, he was almost sure to find Mary at home and alone. Trembling with bodily weakness and a conflict of emotions, he rang the doorbell. To his consternation there appeared Mary's father. "'Hello, Humpleby,' cried Mr. Bowes, surprised but friendly. "'Why, I was just going to write to you. Mary has had scarlet fever.' I've been so busy these last ten days I couldn't even inquire after you. Of course I saw about your smash in the newspaper. How are you getting on? The man with the bandaged arm could not utter a word. Horror-stricken, he stared at Mr. Bowes, who had begun to express a doubt whether it would be prudent for him to enter the house. Mary is convalescent, the anxiety's all over, but... Humpleby suddenly seized the speaker's hand, and in confused words expressed vehement joy. They talked for a few minutes, parted with cordiality, and Humpleby went home again to recover from his excitement. A note from his employers had replied in terms of decent condolence to the message by which he explained his enforced absence. Today he wrote to the principal announcing his intention of resigning his post in their office. The response, delivered within a few hours, was admirably brief and to the point. Mr. Humpleby's place had, of course, been already taken temporarily by another clerk. It would have been held open for him, but, in view of his decision, the firm had merely to request that he would acknowledge the cheque enclosed in payment of his salary up to date. Not without some shaking of the hand did Humpleby pen this receipt. For a moment something seemed to come between him and the daylight, and a heaviness oppressed his inner man. 
but already he had dispatched to London his formal acceptance of the post at five pounds a week, and in thinking of it his heart grew joyous. Two hundred and sixty pounds a year! It was beyond the hope of his most fantastic daydreams. He was a made man, secure for ever against fears and worries. He was a man of substance, and need no longer shrink from making known the hope which ruled his life. A second letter was written to Mary Bowes, but not till many copies had been made was it at length dispatched. The writer declared that he looked for no reply until Mary was quite herself again. He begged only that she would reflect, meanwhile, upon what he had said, reflect with all her indulgence, all her native goodness and gentleness, and, indeed, there elapsed nearly a fortnight before the answer came and to Humpleby it seemed an endless succession of tormenting days. Then Humpleby behaved like one distracted. His landlady in good earnest thought he had gone crazy, and was only reassured when he revealed to her what had happened. Mary Bowes was to be his wife. They must wait for a year and a half. Mary could not leave her father quite alone, but in a year and a half Mr. Bowes, who was an oldish man, would be able to retire on the modest fruit of his economies, and all three could live together in London. What, cried Humpleby, was eighteen months. It would allow him to save enough out of his noble salary to start housekeeping with something more than comfort. Blessed be the name of Chadwick. When his arm was once more sound, and Mary's health quite recovered, they met. In their long, long talk, Humpleby was led to tell the story of that winter day when he saved Leonard Chadwick's life. He related, too, all that had ensued upon his acquaintance with the great Mr. Chadwick, memories which would never lose all their bitterness. Mary was moved to tears, and her tears were dried by indignation. But they agreed that Leonard, after all, made some atonement for his father's heartless behaviour. Humpleby showed a letter that had come from young Chadwick a day or two ago. Every line spoke generosity of spirit. When, he asked, might they expect their new bookkeeper? They were in full swing. Business promised magnificently. As yet, they had only a temporary office, but Geldershaw was in treaty for fine premises in the city. The sooner Humpleby arrived, the better. Fortune awaited him. It was decided that he should leave for London in two days. The next evening he came to spend an hour or two with Mary and her father. On entering the room he at once observed something strange in the looks with which he was greeted. Mary had a pale, miserable air, and could hardly speak. Mr. Bowes, after looking at him fixedly for a moment, exclaimed, "'Have you seen today's paper?' "'I've been too busy,' he replied. "'What has happened?' "'Isn't your London man called Geldershaw?' "'Yes,' murmured Humpleby, with a sinking of the heart. "'Well, the police are after him. "'He has bolted. "'It's a long, firm swindle that he's been up to. "'You know what that means? "'Obtaining goods on false credit and raising money on them? "'What's more, young Chadwick is arrested.' He came before the magistrates yesterday, charged with being an accomplice. Here it is. Read it for yourself. Humpleby dropped into a chair. When his eyes undazzled, he read the full report which Mr. Bowes had summarized. It was the death blow of his hopes. Leonard Chadwick has been a victim, not a swindler, sounded from him in a feeble voice. You see, he says, that Geldershaw has robbed him of all his money, that he is ruined. He says so, remarked Mr. Bowes with angry irony. I believe him, said Humpleby. His eyes sought Mary's. The girl regarded him steadily, and she spoke in a low, firm voice. I, too, believe him. Whether or no, said Mr. Bowes, thrusting his hands into his pockets, the upshot of it is, Humpleby, that you've lost a good place through trusting him. I had my doubts, but you were in a hurry and didn't ask advice. 
If this had happened a week later, the police would have laid hands on you as well. So there's something to be thankful for at all events, said Mary. Again Humpleby met her eyes. He saw that she would not forsake him. He had to begin life over again. That was all. End of chapter 4「The Scrupulous Father」It was market day in the little town. At one o'clock a rustic company besieged the table of the greyhound, lured by savoury odours and the frothing of amber ale. Apart from three frequenters of the ordinary, in a small room prepared for overflow, sat two persons of a different stamp. A middle-aged man, bald, meagre, unimpressive, but wholly respectable in bearing and apparel, and a girl, evidently his daughter, who had the look of the latter twenties, her plain dress harmonizing with a subdued charm of feature and a timidity of manner not ungraceful. Whilst waiting for their meal, they conversed in an undertone. Their brief remarks and ejaculations told of a long morning's ramble from the seaside resort some miles away. In their quiet fashion, they seemed to have enjoyed themselves, and dinner at an inn evidently struck them as something of an escapade. Rather awkwardly, the girl arranged a handful of wild flowers which she had gathered and put them for refreshment into a tumbler of water. When a woman entered with the viands, silence fell upon the two. After hesitations and mutual glances, they began to eat with nervous appetite. Scarcely was their modest confidence restored when in the doorway sounded a virile voice, gaily humming, and they became aware of a tall young man, red-headed, anything but handsome, flushed and perspiring from the sunny road. His open jacket showed a blue cotton shirt without waistcoat. In his hand was a shabby straw hat and thick dust-covered boots. One would have judged him a tourist of the noisier class, and his rather loud, "'Good morning!' as he entered the room seemed a serious menace to privacy. On the other hand, the rapid buttoning of his coat and the quiet choice of a seat as far as possible from the two guests whom his arrival disturbed indicated a certain tact. His greeting had met with the merest murmur of reply. Their eyes on their plates, father and daughter resolutely disregarded him, yet he ventured to speak again. "'They're busy here today. Not a seat to be had in the other room.' It was apologetic in intention, and not rudely spoken. After a moment's delay, the bald, respectable man made a curt response. This room is public, I believe. The intruder held his peace. But more than once he glanced at the girl, and after each furtive scrutiny his plain visage manifested some disturbance, a troubled thoughtfulness. His one look at the mute parent was from beneath contemptuous eyebrows. Very soon another guest appeared, a massive agricultural man, who descended upon a creaking chair and growled a remark about the hot weather. With him the red-haired pedestrian struck into talk. Their topic was beer. Uncommonly good, they agreed, the local brew, and each called for a second pint. What, they asked in concert, would England be without her ale? Shame on the base traffickers who enfeebled or poisoned this noble liquor. And how cool it was! Ah, the right sort of cellar! He of the red hair hinted at a third pewter. These two were still but midway in their stout attack on meat and drink, when father and daughter, having exchanged a few whispers, rose to depart. After leaving the room, the girl remembered that she had left her flowers behind. She durst not return for them, and, knowing her father would dislike to do so, said nothing about the matter. "'A pity!' exclaimed Mr. Whiston, 
that was his respectable name, as they strolled away. It looked at first as if we should have such a nice quiet dinner. I enjoyed it all the same, replied his companion, whose name was Rose. That abominable habit of drinking, added Mr. Whiston austerely. He himself had quaffed water, as always. Their ale, indeed. See the coarse, gross creatures it produces. He shuddered. Rose, however, seemed less consentient than usual. Her eyes were on the ground. Her lips were closed with a certain firmness. When she spoke, it was on quite another subject. They were Londoners. Mr. Whiston held the position of draftsman in the office of a geographical publisher. Though his income was small, he had always practiced a rigid economy, and the possession of a modest private capital put him beyond fear of reverses. Profoundly conscious of social limits, he felt it a subject for gratitude that there was nothing to be ashamed of in his calling, which he might fairly regard as a profession, and he nursed this sense of respectability as much on his daughter's behalf as on his own. Rose was an only child. Her mother had been dead for years. Her kinsfolk on both sides laid claim to the title of gentlefolk, but supported it on the narrowest margin of independence. The girl had grown up in an atmosphere unfavorable to mental development, but she had received a fairly good education, and nature had dowered her with intelligence. A sense of her father's conscientiousness and of his true affection forbade her to criticize openly the principles on which she had directed her life. Hence, a habit of solitary meditation, which half fostered, yet half opposed, the gentle diffidence of Rose's character. Mr. Whiston shrank from society, ceaselessly afraid of receiving less than his due. Privately, meanwhile, he deplored the narrowness of the social opportunities granted to his daughter, and was forever forming schemes for her advantage, schemes which never passed beyond the stage of nervous speculation. They inhabited a little house in a western suburb, a house illumined with every domestic virtue, but scarcely a dozen persons crossed the threshold within a twelvemonth. Rose's two or three friends were, like herself, mistrustful of the world. One of them had lately married after a very long engagement, and Rose still trembled from the excitement of that occasion, still debated fearfully with herself on the bride's chances of happiness. Her own marriage was an event so inconceivable that merely to glance at the thought appeared half immodest and wholly irrational. Every winter Mr. Whiston talked of new places which he and Rose would visit when the holidays came round. Every summer he shrank from the thought of adventurous novelty and ended by proposing a return to the same western seaside town to the familiar lodgings. The climate suited neither him nor his daughter, who both needed physical as well as moral bracing, but they only thought of this on finding themselves at home again, with another long year of monotony before them. And it was so good to feel welcome, respected, to receive the smiling reverences of tradesfolk, to talk with just a little well-bred condescension, sure that it would be appreciated. Mr. Whiston savoured these things, and Rose, in this respect, was not wholly unlike him. Today was the last of their vacation. The weather had been magnificent throughout. Rose's cheeks were more than touched by the sun, greatly to the advantage of her unpretending comeliness. She was a typical English maiden, rather tall, shapely rather than graceful, her head generally bent, her movements always betraying the diffidence of solitary habit. The lips were her finest feature, their perfect outline indicating sweetness without feebleness of character. Such a girl is at her best towards the stroke of thirty. Rose had begun to know herself. She needed only opportunity to act upon her knowledge. A train would take them back to the seaside. At the railway station, Rose seated herself on a shaded part of the platform, whilst her father, who was exceedingly short of sight, peered over publications on the bookstall. Rather tired after her walk, 
the girl was dreamily tracing a pattern with the point of her parasol when someone advanced and stood immediately in front of her startled she looked up and recognized the red-haired stranger of the inn you left these flowers in a glass of water on the table i hope i'm not doing a rude thing in asking whether they were left by accident he had the flowers in his hand their stems carefully protected by a piece of paper for a moment rose was incapable of replying she looked at the speaker she felt her cheeks burn in utter embarrassment she said she knew not what oh thank you i forgot them it's very kind her hand touched his as she took the bouquet from him without another word the man turned and strode away mr whiston had seen nothing of this when he approached rose held up the flowers with a laugh wasn't it kind i forgot them you know and someone from the inn came looking for me very good of them very replied her father graciously a very nice inn that we'll go again some day one likes to encourage such civility it's rare nowadays he of the red hair travelled by the same train though not in the same carriage rose caught sight of him at the seaside station she was vexed with herself for having so scantily acknowledged his kindness it seemed to her that she had not really thanked him at all how absurd at her age to be incapable of common self-command at the same time she kept thinking of her father's phrase coarse gross creatures and it vexed her even more than her own ill behaviour the stranger was certainly not coarse far from gross even his talk about beer she remembered every word of it had been amusing rather than offensive was he a gentleman the question agitated her it involved so technical a definition and she felt so doubtful as to the reply beyond doubt he had acted in a gentlemanly way but his voice lacked something coarse gross no 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 really her father was very severe not to say uncharitable but perhaps he was thinking of the heavy agricultural man oh he must have been of a sudden she felt very weary at the lodgings she sat down in her bedroom and gazed through the open window at the sea a sense of discouragement hitherto almost unknown had fallen upon her it spoilt the blue sky and the soft horizon she thought rather drearily of the townward journey to-morrow of her home in the suburbs of the endless monotony that awaited her the flowers lay on her lap she smelt them dreamed over them and then strange incongruity she thought of beer between tea and supper she and her father rested on the beach mr whiston was reading rose pretended to turn the leaves of a book of a sudden as unexpectedly to herself as to her companion she broke silence don't you think father that we are too much afraid of talking with strangers too much afraid mr whiston was puzzled he had forgotten all about the incident at the dinner-table i mean what harm is there in having a little conversation when one is away from home at the inn to-day you know i can't help thinking we were rather perhaps a little too silent my dear rose did you want to talk about beer she reddened but answered all the more emphatically of course not but when the first gentleman came in wouldn't it have been natural to exchange a few friendly words i'm sure he wouldn't have talked of beer to us the gentleman i saw no gentleman my dear i suppose he was a small clerk or something of the sort and he had no business whatever to address us oh but he only said good morning and apologized for sitting at our table he needn't have apologized at all precisely that is just what i mean said mr whiston with self-satisfaction 
"'My dear Rose, if I had been alone, I might, perhaps, have talked a little. "'But with you it was impossible. "'One cannot be too careful. "'A man like that will take all sorts of liberties. "'One has to keep such people at a distance.' A moment's pause, then Rose spoke with unusual decision. "'I feel quite sure, father, that he would not have taken liberties. It seems to me that he knew quite well how to behave himself.' Mr. Whiston grew still more puzzled. He closed his book to meditate this new problem. "'One has to lay down rules,' fell from him at length sententiously. Our position, Rose, as I have often explained, is a delicate one. A lady in circumstances such as yours cannot exercise too much caution. Your natural associates are in the world of wealth. Unhappily, I cannot make you wealthy. We have to guard our self-respect, my dear child. Really, it is not safe to talk with strangers, least of all at an inn. "'And you have only to remember that disgusting conversation about beer.' "'Rose said no more. "'Her father pondered a little, felt that he had delivered his soul, and resumed the book. "'The next morning they were early at the station to secure good places for the long journey to London. "'Up to almost the last moment it seemed that they would have a carriage to themselves.' Then the door suddenly opened, a bag was flung onto the seat, and after it came a hot, panting man, a red-haired man, recognized immediately by both the travellers. "'I thought I'd missed it,' ejaculated the intruder, merrily. Mr. Whiston turned his head away, disgust transforming his countenance. Rose sat motionless, her eyes cast down and the stranger mopped his forehead in silence. He glanced at her. He glanced again and again, and Rose was aware of every look. It did not occur to her to feel offended. On the contrary, she fell into a mood of tremulous pleasure, enhanced by every turn of the stranger's eyes in her direction. At him she did not look, yet she saw him. Was it a coarse face? she asked herself. Plain, perhaps, but decidedly not vulgar. The red hair, she thought, was not disagreeably red. She didn't dislike that shade of colour. He was humming a tune. It seemed to be his habit, and it argued healthy cheerfulness. Meanwhile, Mr. Whiston sat stiffly in his corner, staring at the landscape, a model of respectable muteness. At the first stop, another man entered, this time unmistakably a commercial traveller. At once a dialogue sprang up between him and Rufus. The traveller complained that all the smoking compartments were full. "'Why?' exclaimed Rufus, with a laugh. "'That reminds me that I wanted a smoke. I never thought about it till now. Jumped in here in a hurry.' The traveller's line was tobacco. They talked tobacco, Rufus with much gusto. Presently the conversation took a wider scope. "'I envy you,' cried Rufus, always travelling about. "'I'm in a beastly office, and get only a fortnight off once a year. I enjoy it, I can tell you. Time's up today, worse luck. I've a good mind to emigrate. Can you give me a tip about the colonies?' He talked of how he had spent his holiday. Rose missed not a word, and her blood pulsed in sympathy with the joy of freedom which he expressed. She did not mind his occasional slang. The tone was manly and right-hearted. It evinced a certain simplicity of feeling by no means common in men, whether gentle or other. At a certain moment the girl was impelled to steal a glimpse of his face. After all, was it really so plain? The features seemed to her to have a certain refinement which she had not noticed before. "'I'm going to try for a smoker,' said the man of commerce, as the train slackened into a busy station. Rufus hesitated. His eye wandered. 
"'I think I shall stay where I am,' he ended by saying. In that same moment, for the first time, Rose met his glance. She saw that his eyes did not at once avert themselves. They had a singular expression, a smile which pleaded pardon for its audacity, and Rose, even whilst turning away, smiled in response. The train stopped. The commercial traveller alighted. Rose, leaning towards her father, whispered that she was thirsty. Would he get her a glass of milk or lemonade? Though little disposed to rush on such errands, Mr. Whiston had no choice but to comply. He sped at once for the refreshment room, and Rose knew what would happen. She knew perfectly. Sitting rigid, her eyes on vacancy, she felt the approach of the young man, who for the moment was alone with her. She saw him at her side. She heard his voice. "'I can't help it. I want to speak to you. May I?' Rose faltered a reply. "'It was so kind of you to bring the flowers. I didn't thank you properly.' "'It's now or never,' pursued the young man in rapid, excited tones. "'Will you let me tell you my name? Will you tell me yours?' Rose's silence consented. The daring Rufus rent a page from a pocket-book, scribbled his name and address, gave it to Rose. He rent out another page, offered it to Rose with the pencil, and in a moment had secured the precious scrap of paper in his pocket. Scarce was the transaction completed when a stranger jumped in. The young man bounded to his own corner, just in time to see the return of Mr. Whiston, glass in hand. During the rest of the journey, Rose was in the strangest state of mind. She did not feel in the least ashamed of herself. It seemed to her that what had happened was wholly natural and simple. The extraordinary thing was that she must sit silent and with cold countenance at the distance of a few feet from a person with whom she ardently desired to converse. Sudden illumination had wholly changed the aspect of life. She seemed to be playing a part in a grotesque comedy rather than living in a world of grave realities. Her father's dignified silence struck her as intolerably absurd. She could have burst into laughter. At moments she was indignant, irritated, tremulous with the spirit of revolt. She detected a glance of frigid superiority with which Mr. Whiston chanced to survey the other occupants of the compartment. It amazed her. Never had she seen her father in such an alien light. He bent forward and addressed to her some commonplace remark. She barely deigned a reply. Her views of conduct, of character, had undergone an abrupt and extraordinary change. Having justified without shadow of argument her own incredible proceeding, she judged everything and everybody by some new standard mysteriously attained. She was no longer the Rose Whiston of yesterday. Her old self seemed an object of compassion. She felt an unspeakable happiness, and at the same time an encroaching fear. The fear predominated. When she grew aware of the streets of London looming on either hand, it became a torment, an anguish. Small folded, Crushed within her palm, the piece of paper with its still unread inscription seemed to burn her. Once, twice, thrice, she met the look of her friend. He smiled cheerily, bravely, with evident purpose of encouragement. She knew his face better than that of any oldest acquaintance. She saw in it a manly beauty. Only by a great effort of self-control could she refrain from turning aside to unfold and read what he had written. The train slackened speed, stopped. Yes, it was London. She must arise and go. Once more their eyes met. Then, without recollection of any interval, she was on the Metropolitan Railway, moving towards her suburban home. A severe headache sent her early to bed. 
Beneath her pillow lay a scrap of paper with a name and address she was not likely to forget, and through the night of broken slumbers Rose suffered a martyrdom. No more self-glorification, all her courage gone, all her new vitality. She saw herself with the old eyes, and was shame-stricken to the very heart. Who's the fault? Towards dawn she argued it with the bitterness of misery. What a life was hers in this little world of choking respectabilities! Forbidden this, forbidden that. Permitted the pride of ladyhood. And she was not a lady, after all. What lady would have permitted herself to exchange names and addresses with a strange man in a railway carriage? furtively, too, escaping her father's observation. If not a lady, what was she? It meant the utter failure of her breeding and education. The sole end for which she had lived was frustrate. A common, vulgar young woman, well-mated, doubtless, with an impudent clerk whose noisy talk was of beer and tobacco. This arrested her, stung to the defence of her friend, who, clerk though he might be, was neither impudent nor vulgar, she found herself driven back upon self-respect. The battle went on for hours. It exhausted her. It undid all the good effects of sun and sea, and left her flaccid, pale. "'I'm afraid the journey yesterday was too much for you,' remarked Mr. Whiston, after observing her as she sat mute the next evening. "'I shall soon recover,' Rose answered coldly. The father meditated with some uneasiness. He had not forgotten Rose's singular expression of opinion after their dinner at the inn. His affection made him sensitive to changes in the girl's demeanour. Next summer they must really find a more bracing resort. Yes, yes, clearly Rose needed bracing but she was always better when the cool days came round. On the morrow it was his daughter's turn to feel anxious. Mr. Whiston, all at once, wore a face of indignant severity. He was absent-minded. He sat at table with scarce a word. He had little nervous movements and subdued mutterings as of wrath. This continued on a second day and Rose began to suffer an intolerable agitation. She could not help connecting her father's strange behaviour with the secret which tormented her heart. Had something happened? Had her friend seen Mr. Whiston, or written to him? She had awaited with tremors every arrival of the post. It was probable, more than probable, that he would write to her. But as yet no letter came. A week passed, and no letter came. Her father was himself again. Plainly she had mistaken the cause of his perturbation. Ten days, and no letter came. It was Saturday afternoon. Mr. Whiston reached home at tea-time. The first glance showed his daughter that trouble and anger once more beset him. She trembled, and all but wept for suspense had overwrought her nerves. "'I find myself obliged to speak to you on a very disagreeable subject,' thus began Mr. Whiston over the teacups. "'A very unpleasant subject, indeed. My one consolation is that it will probably settle a little argument we had down at the seaside. As his habit was when expressing grave opinions, and Mr. Whiston seldom expressed any other, he made a long pause, and ran his fingers through his thin beard. The delay irritated Rose to the last point of endurance. "'The fact is,' he proceeded at length, "'a week ago I received a most extraordinary letter, the most impudent letter I ever read in my life. It came from that noisy beer-drinking man who intruded upon us at the inn, you remember. He began by explaining who he was, and, if you can believe it, had the impertinence to say that he wished to make my acquaintance. An amazing letter. 
Naturally, I left it unanswered, the only dignified thing to do. But the fellow wrote again, asking if I had received his proposal. I now replied, briefly and severely, asking him, first, how he came to know my name, secondly, what reason I had given him for supposing that I desired to meet him again. His answer to this was even more outrageous than the first offence. He bluntly informed me that in order to discover my name and address he had followed us home that day from Paddington Station. As if this was not bad enough, he went on to— "'Really, Rose, I feel I must apologize to you, but the fact is I seem to have no choice but to tell you what he said. The fellow tells me, really, that he wants to know me, only that he may come to know you.' My first idea was to go with this letter to the police. I am not sure that I shan't do so even yet. Most certainly I shall if he writes again. The man may be crazy. He may be dangerous. Who knows, but he may be lurking about this house. I feel obliged to warn you of this unpleasant possibility. Rose was stirring her tea. Also, she was smiling. She continued to stir and to smile, without consciousness of either performance. "'You make light of it,' exclaimed her father solemnly. "'Oh, father, of course I am sorry you have had this annoyance.' So little was there of manifest sorrow in the girl's tone and countenance that Mr. Whiston gazed at her rather indignantly. His pregnant pause gave birth to one of those admonitory axioms which had hitherto ruled his daughter's life. "'My dear, I advise you never to trifle with questions of propriety. Could there possibly be a better illustration of what I have so often said, that in self-defence we are bound to keep strangers at a distance?' "'Father,' Rose began firmly, but her voice failed. "'You were going to say, Rose?' She took her courage in both hands. "'Will you allow me to see the letters? "'Certainly, there can be no objection to that.' He drew from his pockets the three envelopes, held them to his daughter. With shaking hand, Rose unfolded the first letter. It was written in clear commercial character, and was signed Charles James Burroughs. When she had read all, the girl said, quietly, "'Are you quite sure, father, that these letters are impertinent?' Mr. Whiston stopped in the act of finger-combing his beard. "'What doubt can there be of it?' "'They seem to me,' proceeded Rose nervously, "'to be very respectful and very honest.' "'My dear, you astound me.' Is it respectful to force one's acquaintance upon an unwilling stranger? I really don't understand you. Where is your sense of propriety, Rose? A vulgar, noisy fellow who talks of beer and tobacco? A petty clerk? And he has the audacity to write to me that he wants to... to make friends with my daughter? Respectful? Honest? Really? When Mr. Whiston became sufficiently agitated to lose his decorous gravity, he began to splutter, and at such moments he was not impressive. Rose kept her eyes cast down. She felt her strength once more, the strength of a wholly reasonable and half-passionate revolt against that tyrannous propriety which Mr. Whiston worshipped. "'Father? Well, my dear,' There is only one thing I dislike in these letters, and that is a falsehood. I don't understand. Rose was flushing. Her nerves grew tense. She had wrought herself to a simple audacity which overcame small embarrassments. Mr. Burroughs says that he followed us home from Paddington to discover our address. That is not true. He asked me for my name and address in the train, and gave me his. The father gasped. He asked, you gave? It was whilst you were away in the refreshment room, 
proceeded the girl with singular self-control, in a voice almost matter-of-fact. "'I ought to tell you, at the same time, that it was Mr. Burroughs who brought me the flowers from the inn, when I forgot them. You didn't see him give them to me in the station.' The father stared. "'But, Rose, what does all this mean? You—you you overwhelm me. Go on, please. What next?' "'Nothing, father.' And of a sudden the girl was so beset with confusing emotions that she hurriedly quitted her chair and vanished from the room. Before Mr. Whiston returned to his geographical drawing on Monday morning, he had held long conversations with Rose, and still longer with himself. Not easily could he perceive the justice of his daughter's quarrel with propriety. Many days were to pass, indeed, before he would consent to do more than make inquiries about Charles James Burroughs, and to permit that aggressive young man to give a fuller account of himself in writing. It was by silence that Rose prevailed. Having defended herself against the charge of immodesty, she declined to urge her own inclination or the rights of Mr. Burroughs. Her mute patience did not lack its effect with the scrupulous but tender parent. "'I am willing to admit, my dear,' said Mr. Whiston one evening, apropos of nothing at all, "'that the falsehood in that young man's letter gave proof of a certain delicacy.' "'Thank you, father,' replied Rose, very quietly and simply. It was next morning that the father posted a formal, proper, self-respecting note of invitation, which bore results. End of chapter 5